Owen Dell, RLA, ASLA, is an award-winning, internationally admired landscape architect, author, and educator. Owen has been part of the landscape profession since 1971, and he has played a key role in the development of many practices of sustainable landscaping and related topics. He is the author of How to Start a Home-Based Landscaping Business and Sustainable Landscaping for Dummies. Owen has also been a regular contributor to many national and regional horticultural publications, including Sunset Magazine, Fine Gardening, and others. For five years, he was the co-host and co-creator of the popular Santa Barbara television series, Garden Wise Guys. Owen Hat is the principal at Owen Dell Associates, LLC in Corvallis, Oregon, specializing in landscape sustainability. Uh, sustainable Landscape Architectural Services. Locally, Owen has been chair of the Corvallis Sustainability Coalition's Food Action Team Garden Group, a member of the coalition's Water Action Team, chair of the Corvallis Civic Beautification and Urban Forestry Advisory Board, a founding member of the Willamette Valley Regenerative Landscape Coalition, and a frequent, frequent contributor of his time and expertise to many local causes. He has been a presenter at Insights into Gardening, Gearing Up for Gardening, Academy for Lifelong Learning, Benton County and Lynn County Master Gardeners Associations, the Oregon Master Gardeners Association Mini College, OSU Landscape Horticulture Department, and other local events. Thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you to the Marion Soil and Water Conservation District, and I uh, really appreciate you guys for having me. So. We have an hour in the interest of time. I'm just going to roll right into it. And I'd like to start with some very basic concepts to give you a grounding in, in uh, what we're basically going to look at are solutions. Oh, by the way, the title is pro Water Management Pro Tips. And the idea there is that uh, being a landscape pro myself, um, I can cut you in on some of the secrets that water management people use in the profession. Uh, kind of like those, uh, what do they say on the internet? One weird trick to do thus and so to lose your belly fat or something. I can't do much for your belly fat, but um, I can certainly do uh, something for your water management. So here we go. Um, first of all, um, these dots are very interesting. The little blue dot, the sphere on the left is all of the potable water on the planet. It's spread out in a very thin film, of course. Uh, terrestrially over uh, the land surface. And it doesn't look like much when you gather it all up like that. I don't know how they did that, by the way. It's quite interesting. And then on the right, not really germane to what we're doing today, but that's all the breathable air that we have, or I should put breathable in quotes, I suppose, these days. The next thing to keep in mind is obviously global warming and climate change and temperatures are going up. And that means an increase in uh, demand for water for horticulture and everything else. Looking at the local situation, um, we could be in much worse shape. And what you see here is obviously Marion County and adjacent counties and the, um, the yellow is um, abnormally dry or at least it was as of April 5th. Now we've had quite a bit of rain since then. It's still raining, which is really good. Although we're probably all pretty tired of it. Um, and so, you know, we're really not in too bad a shape. Uh, Western Oregon is not doing as bad as Southern Oregon, Eastern Oregon, and the rest of the, rest of the Western United States. I also want to share with you, and you probably know this already, this is a chart showing the um, rainfall, which is the green bars. And of course, we live in a Northern Mediterranean climate. And so we don't get that much rain in the summertime. Here's May, June, July, August, September pretty dry. The rest of the year is very wet. And then the temperatures on this, um, this red line at the top, uh, maximum temperature, uh, and I think the average, here's the average right here, this purple one. And so it's hot and dry in the summer, and it's cool or cold and wet um, in, in the wintertime. And that's, that's how we live. And that's what this is all about, is dealing with this mid-range here, where we do have to add supplemental water if we have plants that do not make it through our normal rainfall patterns. Oh, there we go. Um, 
These are stomata. I would ask for a show of hands, but I can't see you. Um, stomata are the little openings on the bottoms of leaves of all plants. And what they do is they facilitate gas exchange, basically. And they're um, spewing out um, oxygen, which is good for us. In the course of doing that, they incidentally really release water. They have to release some of the water in their cells. It simply escapes with the, with the gases, with the oxygen. Um, and that's where the trouble starts, because if it weren't for stomata, we wouldn't have to water. Plants could get their complement of water and live with it forever. But because of these little gadgets right here, um, we have to supplement and replace the water that they're losing. So um, this is a picture of a water audit in progress. And you'll see the sprinkler in the bottom and some catch can cups. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. For now, I'd like to share a few thoughts with you. Um, that little sphere that we looked at represents all the potable water on the planet, which is about 0.3% of all the water in the oceans and non-potable water, salt water, et cetera. Um, 30 to 60% of that within um, urban and suburban areas, particularly suburban areas, is used for landscape water. Um, translating that into Marion County, domestic water use in Marion County uh, is averaging over the year 44 million gallons per day. 44 million gallons per day, that's a lot of water. And traditionally, given normal landscape management, water management practices, about 50% of that is wasted due to runoff, uh, atomization, uh, wind drift, overspray, um, and just general mismanagement, overwatering, and so forth. So that number right there is, is what is giving us promise to do better um, than what we do now. So there's a thing called ET, and it's not this ET over here. It's evapotranspiration, which is a big fancy word. And if you break it down, it just means the net total of the evaporation of water off the land and off of the surface of plants and everything else, along with transpiration. Transpiration is the water that comes in through the roots of a plant, doesn't matter whether it's a tree or a flower or whatever, and goes up through the plant, through the xylem tissue, and then gets transpired through those stomata, so the use of water. So evapotranspiration is a, is a scientific term, it's a measurement, and it's how we express how much water is being used within a landscape system. So all that having been said, what can you do on your property to save water? Well, here's what we're going to talk about uh, today. First of all, design, creating the landscape. If we create an adapted landscape, one that doesn't need a lot of water, um, then we're gonna obviously be off to a good start. Hydrozoning is something that many of you probably don't know about. And I'm gonna go into that in some detail because it's a very interesting concept that can really make a difference in the success of your landscaping, not only in terms of water use, but just generally. I wanna talk a little bit about harvesting rainwater and using gray water. Um, those are not big ticket items in terms of water management, but they're interesting to a lot of people and they do have a place. Um, I want to give you one weird tip about watering by hand, <laughs> and I think you'll like that. And then I want to talk about the difference between drip and sprinklers and the difference between the types of drip systems. So those are you know, what you'd call infrastructure, physical elements. And then the last one is about your mind, your brain, your awareness, your knowledge which is management of all that once you have it. How do you manage that water um, so that you're doing the right thing? Because you can actually do all of these things up here, these first half a dozen things and manage water badly and you're still gonna be wasting water. So let's take a look at these one at a time. What does it mean to have an adapted landscape? Well, it means that you're designing a landscape so that it's suited to local conditions of all kinds, weather, soil, exposure, everything about the landscape. You're thinking it through so that you're not just putting in plants as a kind of exterior decoration. You're actually doing things that create what I think of as a synthetic or man-made ecosystem that is going to reach what biologists call homeostasis, self-regulation, without too many inputs of any kind, fertilizer, water, pruning, et cetera. And so that is really the key to a successful landscape is what you do in creating it. 
suited to local conditions, where possible, able to survive on rainfall alone. And we get, you know, 40 to 42, 45 inches, depending on where you are here in the valley, in the flat part of the valley per year. And even though it's seasonal, that's a pretty good amount of rain. So our demand for supplemental irrigation water is much lower compared to drier, hotter places. Um, an adapted landscape should be tolerant of variations in rainfall, in all the conditions that exist within that ecosystem. And the irrigation that you do, whether it's through a, a sprinkler system, a drip system, or by hand, should really be thought of simply as a backup to rainfall and just give it enough to keep it healthy and no more. And everyone's experience in this profession is that most people, particularly homeowners, grossly overwater, some of them underwater, but the people who love their gardens and really care for their gardens, generally speaking, actually apply more water than, than, than the garden actually needs. And they do that because it looks dry or it's hot and they think, oh, well, I should water or because they like to water. Or there's a lot of reasons behind it. There's some interesting psychology behind the whole thing. But if we can get you off of that, um, and if you can think of this as, um, as a backup to, nat to nature, you might say, then you'll be in good shape. So let's talk about hydrozones. I don't know how many people have heard this term. It's, it's a fairly esoteric idea, even within the landscape profession. And it's very, very simple. You put the wet stuff in one place, that is the plants that like to be watered a lot. Um, and you should keep those to a minimum, obviously. And then the plants that like it dry go in another physical place. These are two physical places. Here's how it looks on a typical landscape. Um, the house is in the middle. You've got uh, controllers, irrigation controllers. Some people have those, some people don't. Um, we've got a lawn. The lawn is a hydrozone. It's in blue. There's three of those. That's going to have a particular kind of water use and a particular frequency and quantity uh, of water. The shrubs are a different hydrozone. Trees, whoops, sorry. Every once in a while it does that. I don't know why. Vegetable beds are a hydrozone. Flower beds are a hydrozone and so forth. So those are discrete areas. They're physically packaged um, so that the plants within those areas ha have compatible water needs so that you're not mixing high and low water use plants within any of these hydrozones. Now, you probably have never thought about this before. If you're like the average gardener, you just put things where they look good and that's okay, but you can still do that and hydrozone everything and, and life will get a lot better for you and your plants. Here's another look at it, just a different graphic. And again, there's a tree zone here. There's um, a native plant zone. I'd like to see a lot more native plants in those three in the corner. Um, high water flower zone and lawns and shrubs, okay? So it's a pretty simple thing. There's, there's no rocket science to it. How do you do it? First of all, you find out what the water needs are of the plants that you're planning to use. And this again, goes back to the planning stage, the designing stage or redesigning your garden or rethinking your garden. And you have to understand the difference between a high water use and a low water use and a medium water use plant. And then you group those, very simple, according to need, the wet plants here and the dry plants there. And then you divide the irrigation system into zones, as was shown. It's not only zones of plants, it's also, if you have an irrigation system, it's zones that are separately valved and separately controlled for each hydrozone. Okay, and so you have separate valves for the high and low water use plants, but also for different microclimates. A sunny area is going to use more water than a shady area in most cases, not always, we'll get to that in a minute. Windy areas are gonna use more water than sheltered areas. A heavy soil is gonna hold water much longer and hold more water than a light soil. And so it's not just about the plants that are there, it's also about the entire package of the microclimate plus the plants. And then every time that you have a new variable, like you'll have a sunny, low water use, windy area, that needs a valve. You have an area with heavy soils in the shade uh, and high water use plants, that needs a valve. So it can get fairly complicated in the design process. One of the things to keep in mind is how can we keep this as simple as possible so we don't have 20 or 30 valves on a residential scale garden? Well, okay, so let's go in a little deeper. High in water use plants, here we go. Ferns use a lot of water, cactus don't. Don't put those together. They're not gonna be happy. 
you're either going to overwater the cactus or underwater the ferns. You cannot win that game. So they need to be segregated from one another. Okay, simple idea, but maybe you never thought about it. So just a few examples of plants by water requirement, and this is by no means exhaustive, but you can see over here, there's in the high water requiring plants, there's you know, alder, horsetail, roses, ferns, huckleberries, lawn, just a few examples of things that we might use here in the valley. And then the lower water requirement, things are more native, our native Oregon grape, Cenothus, Oregon oak, ponderosa pine, again, not an exhaustive list, and they don't all have to be native. There are many low water requirement plants that are not native, like lavender, for example. Okay, here's a good resource, by the way, for low water use native plants. And I just wanna say, the more native plants you can put in your garden, the better the pollinators are gonna like it, the better that um, the whole nature, natural system is, is going to like it because our wildlife, whether it's insects, butterflies, birds, uh, are adapted to our native plants. They're adapted to the pollen, they're adapted to the nectar, they're adapted to the floral shapes of the floral tubes or whatever it is. And so we really want to have a lot of natives in our gardens. And we're so lucky here because the Oregon native plants are gorgeous and they're easy. Doesn't mean you have to have all natives, but I would suggest that the more natives you can plug into your system, the better it will be. And this is a really good resource that the Mar Marion Soil and Water Conservation District has. You can go to marionswcd.net and uh, find that. And it's a really great list of native plants. It makes your life as a, as a garden designer um, easier. By the way, not all native plants are drought tolerant because we live if those of us who live in the flats um, are living on many cases on what was called and still is in some cases wet prairie. Well, we know what that is. Just go outside right now after it's been raining for months and you'll see ponding everywhere. The water table has come up to the surface. Everything is soaking wet. So, you know, you don't want to necessarily have drought requiring plants in those areas because they will get drowned. You have to look at what, and this is true of native plants and also non-native plants, what plant communities are they native to or what kind of plant communities were they native to in their original location? And then you have to fit those into the hydrology of your site. If you've got dry areas and wet areas, you really have to take that under uh, consideration. So um, you need to site everything appropriately, regardless of the kind of plant that it is. Sunny and shady areas. Well, obviously out in the hot sun, plants are, those stromata are gonna be working harder. Plants are gonna be transpiring a lot more water. And so you need to replace that or the plants will simply run out of water. So the frequency and the quantity of water in a sunny area is gonna be greater than it is in a shady area. Um, and vice versa, the shade areas um, oftentimes need less water. But I wanna to get to that in a minute because there's one weird trick there too. Um, so your frequency and quantity can be less, but <laughs> there's different kinds of shade. And this gets a little bit interesting, a little bit complicated. The shade of a building is very different from the shade of a tree. A building doesn't have any roots. It's not drawing water out of the soil. It's just creating shade. And the north side of a building can be very wet for a long time. But under a tree or even on the north side of a tree, there's a tree there and it's and it's pulling moisture along with nutrients and sunlight from the area. And so it's competing with your plants and it actually can dry out faster sometimes than even some sunny areas. And there's also a really interesting matter of seasonal shade because we all know that in the wintertime, the sun is low in the horizon and in the summertime, it's up high. And we're at the 45th parallel here, which is halfway between the North Pole and the equator. And we're just far enough north that uh, at, the, at the summer solstice, the sun is, um, isn't just directly overhead, it's actually to the north of directly overhead, if you will. And sometimes, well, not sometimes, every year, the sunlight will actually kick in to the north side of say a building. And all of a sudden those shade plants are getting beaten down by the hot sun. And it can be very, very, challenging for the plants. And that's something that most people don't think about. And interestingly, if you go out on say, you know, the, sol the summer solstice or thereabouts, and you look at where the shade is, sometimes the shade, because of that 
feature of the sun being further north, the shade will actually be on the south side of the plant. It took me a while to figure that out because I'm most of my career was spent down in Southern California and that doesn't happen down there. So that's an interesting thing to take into account. Uh, windy areas obviously um, will, will have greater evapotranspiration. Again, pulling water off those stomata as the water is evaporated off the stomata, the stomata is delivering more and more. And so the frequency and quantity of water needed is greater in windy areas. And you can see an example here with this tree somewhere in the wind. And it's, this is a phenomenon called Krumholzing, which means that everything gets blown over to one side and you see this on the coast a lot where everything is flattened right down to the bluffs. And then there's a very important matter of soils. Um, most of our soils, and I'm sure that all of you as gardeners have seen the soil triangle before with sand down in the lower left corner and clay up at the top, silt over here and so forth, and all the permutations and variations, which has to do with how much sand, silt and clay is in any given soil. Most of our soils in the valley, down the valley floor are clays. They hold a lot of water. They're very, very fine textured. Um, they don't always release water completely um, as a sand will. Um, they don't need watering all that much. And you will be surprised uh, if you check the soil moisture and you think that plants need watering and you find out that it's actually quite wet down even a few inches. The other thing about Clay soils is the infiltration rate is much slower than a sandy soil, which means that if you have an irrigation system or if you're hand watering and it's putting water on at too high a what we call a precipitation rate, which means basically how hard is it raining, essentially, uh, it'll run off and then it hasn't soaked in. And then there's a matter of internal drainage, which means if you dig a hole, say the size of a five gallon bucket and you fill it with water, and you come back in a day or two and there's, it's still full of water, you have essentially no internal drainage. That's a wet spot and that's potentially a problem for your plants, especially if you're overwatering. On the other hand, if you come back in an hour and it's gone, then you're probably on a sandy soil down here in this lower part of the, of the triangle and you're gonna to need to water much more frequently. Um, I would encourage everybody to go out and dig a hole in the garden somewhere in a representative spot and see what actually happens. And you might learn something. So when you add all this up and we think about the hydrozones and then we translate all this into a watering schedule, it's gonna look maybe something like this. So you have your lawns are a hydrozone. The lawns are on an overhead sprinkler system. And if you're watering your lawns, and of course here in the Valley, a lot of people don't water their lawns and that's okay because that saves water. But if, if you're watering your lawn, then it might be three times a week. Generally lawns need about an inch of water a week. So you put on a third of an inch um, uh, per watering times three. And I'm gonna explain how to learn about that in a few minutes. Your perennial borders in the sun are on drip and they're gonna need a couple times a week and 30 minutes. The perennial borders in the shade also on drip, but they only need to be watered maybe once a week. Now this is not, you shouldn't write this down and go do that <laughs> because it depends on your situation. This is just an example of what might be typical. Shrubs and hedges once a week, vegetables a lot because annual vegetables are thirsty. Native plants, I said every two weeks, but you know what? Native plants are fine with natural rainfall. So after an establishment period of two or three years, um, probably zero, unless you're really having a heat wave. And even then let those plants just get through it because they know better than we do um, how to deal with that. And if you overwater a native plant, sometimes you can kill it if you're watering in the summertime um, by introducing favorable conditions of warm, wet soil for pathogens to come in and, and kill the plant. Uh, ground cover under trees three times a week because the trees are taking water and windy hilltop as maybe as much as five times a week. Again, everyone's situation is, is different, of course. So let's talk a little bit about drip versus sprinklers. Sprinklers basically spray water everywhere. Everybody's familiar with them. Drip came out about 40 years ago, and um, it's, been, um, it's been a very good thing for water conservation. A proper drip system will use about half the water of an overhead sprinkler system, and it uses it much more effect efficiently. A sprinkler system at its maximum efficiency is about 70% of the, 
efficient. 30% of the water is wasted. Drip is nearly 100% efficient. All the water goes down into the roots. Um, what you see in this picture is what's called drip on a grid. And the idea here is that you see that the tubes are placed about, they're about a foot apart. They're generally away from the plants because you don't want drippers watering right at the crown of most kinds of plants. They don't like that. Um, and then built into the tubing, which you can't see here, are emitters. They're actually molded right into the drip tubing and they're spaced every foot. So you've got an emitter essentially every single foot across the entire landscape. And when that comes on, it's like natural rainfall. As it goes underground, it's dripping very slowly, anywhere from a half a gallon per hour to two gallons per hour, depending on the type of emitter that you specify. Then the capillary action of the soil, particularly in the clay soil, will move that water laterally until all the wetting patterns of all the drippers meet underground. And it's really pretty much just like rainfall in that regard. There's no overhead spray, there's no runoff, there's no spray drift, you're not watering your neighbor's car, you're not watering the sidewalk. Um, it's very effective. And we have put in, I don't know, hundreds of these systems, some of them very big with in commercial and public properties where there are 30, 40 valves or more on large, large installations. I've never had a problem with that system. And so I really like it a lot. It's, it's runtime and frequency are going to be different than sprinklers. So don't make the mistake of mixing a drip system and a sprinkler system on the same valve, because you can't do that. If you watered 20 minutes for the sprinklers, for example, it wouldn't be enough to run the drip system. And if you watered, again, hypothetically two hours for the drip system, it would be too much for the sprinklers. So those are always separated. They're on separate valves, separate hydrozones. Here's a few other issues. Water table, the aspect of the slope, what a little more about what happens under trees, and let's talk a little bit about microclimates in general. Here's a picture of a water table. Obviously, uh, you can see the blue zone is the water table and where the terrain dips down. You have a river, a lake, a pond, or whatever it is. Above that is this zone of aeration. It's not in the water table, although roots can go down into there. And these are very different, and, and this is very important in our valley because we're sitting right on top of that water table in the wintertime, and it does come to the surface in places that, um, you know, are basically everywhere, if there's any terrain at all. Let's go outside and take a look around after this talk, and you'll see what I'm talking about if you happen to not have noticed this before. So you want to locate your plants with that water table in mind so you're not drowning things um, that um, do not like to be underwater for six months of the year. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you'll read in a gardening book about a plant or you'll read online on the internet about a plant, it'll say requires good drainage, needs good drainage, needs perfect drainage. Um, sometimes it'll tolerate less than perfect, but, you know, you really need to pay attention to that because the plants are not here to please us. And if they need good drainage and you put them down in the water table, they're probably going to die. Slope aspect is very interesting for those of you who are on a hillside. There's a big difference between the way that a slope faces with regard to the sun. So a north slope is going to get shade most of the year um, because of the way that the sun moves in the sky. A south slope is going to get sun, unless there are trees in the way, pretty much all day from sun up to sundown if it was an open situation like you see in this picture. A west slope is going to get hot afternoon sun, but nothing much before that. And an east slope is going to get the morning sun and then it'll go away. Well, what does that mean in terms of plants? It means that the evapotranspiration rate is much higher on the south and west slopes and much lower on the north and east slopes. It's another thing you need to take into account. Obviously for planting design for all sorts of other things like how much sun they get, but in terms of watering, we go back to the hydrozone idea. Those are all different hydrozones. Now under trees is very interesting because trees use water. They compete with everything that's under them. To get something that's like in this picture over here is, is challenging because those plants have their roots right down in the same place where the tree is that towers above them. 
So a lot of times you actually have to water more under trees, particularly trees with high water demand. You know, if you're growing uh, as I am here with cottonwood roots in my backyard, I, I have to water more because stuff dries out almost instantly. That tree on a hot day is just dragging all the water up out of the soil and running it through those millions of stomata. And you have to accommodate that. So you have to choose plants that tolerate understory conditions if you're going to be gardening under trees, which most of us are in, in, in Western Oregon. Um, gardening books will help you with that. There are lists of things that will work under trees and those are fairly easy to find in books or on the internet. Let's talk about tree roots for a minute. This is, um, this is a picture of what I was taught in junior high school in science class. Uh, Dr. Galeno, uh, I, I will never forget her. Um, she was a good science teacher, but you know they didn't know things then, or maybe they were just making it up because they were trying to keep us from throwing spitballs or something, I don't know. And they had this story that the roots of the tree were about the same kind of an inverted version of the crown of the tree. They went out about as far as the crown did, and they were about as deep and they looked similar. And this was the model that, that we were taught. This is what a tree is underground. Well, you know, I hate to break it to you, but that was a totally made up story. It has nothing to do with reality, okay? So um, here's, here's what's really going on. Uh, and this of course will vary from tree to tree. Some trees are not like this, but the majority of them are. You have the canopy, and you have most of the roots in the top 18 inches of soil. Why? Well, that's where the, the humic acids are, that's where the nutrients are, that's where the oxygen is, that's where all the beneficial microflora and microfauna are, that's where the mycorrhizal fungi are. Um, there isn't that much below 18 inches that the plants really want, including big old trees. And they spread very, very far from the canopy, anywhere from three to 10 times the extent of the canopy. So go out in your yard, not right now, but when we're done, and take a look at the trees in your neighborhood and think about three to 10 times the canopy width. How many tree roots are you standing on in any given place? And those tree roots are competing for moisture and nutrients. And if you don't believe this model, just go take a hike and, and in the forest and you'll find sooner or later a tree that fell over and you'll see this huge root mass. And it looks like a, it's been described as the tree being a uh, wine glass and the root system being a wine glass sitting on a dinner plate. And that's the proportions of the thing. And you'll see what I'm talking about. So this is very important to know because what it means is in most cases, unless you're in a new subdivision or something, you're gardening with over tree roots and with tree roots. And so we have to accommodate that with our watering as well. So what is a microclimate? Well, there are microclimates like maybe your neighborhood or your little hillside or whatever, but then there are also what I call nanoclimates, which are little places around your property, the north side of your house and the west side of your garage. And these are all different areas in terms of growing conditions and certainly over time, as things dry out, it's gonna dry out faster in some areas than others. And so you have to understand again, where is it wettest in hydrozone using higher water use plants and more sheltered and shady locations. Then you'll begin to have something that has that homeostasis in it. Let's talk about a couple of, of alternatives um, to either your well water or your municipal water. Most people are on municipal water unless you're out in a rural area, so you're paying for water. Um, there is rainwater harvesting. And what you see here is a couple of tanks and you can just barely see, I don't know if my pointer shows up or not, I think it does. You can just barely see the gutter and a pipe going in and it fills up these tanks which are connected together so they fill equally. And then down at the bottom is a little pump and the water goes in in the wintertime and they fill up very easily because you can harvest tons of water, way more than these couple tanks. These are, I think these are 2000 gallon tanks. Um, and then in the summer you use it up. Um, and it's a nice idea, it's, it's, it works um, and it's pretty low tech, 
but it's got some it's got some downsides and it's not for everybody. First of all, this is ugly. I mean, this is a nasty looking thing to have in your backyard and it's huge. And that is certainly not for everybody. They're made from plastic. So you've got all the impacts of that. That's fossil fuel embodied in tanks and pipes and all kinds of other stuff. And then you really, this much water, it sounds like, wow, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. No, it's not. It's not because you're using, you know, tens of thousands of gallons, maybe hundreds of thousands of gallons of water, depending on your size of your property. And this is nothing. This is really literally a drop in the bucket. It's good to have. It's good to have as a supplement. It's good to have for emergencies. By the way, it's not potable water. You must not drink it. It came off your roof. And the only time you would ever drink this is if it was an emergency and we had a big earthquake or something and there was no water. And then you would still have to treat it um, because drinking this grungy water would be better than, than dying, basically. But it is not for drinking water. Um, and you have to put it on edible plants carefully because it can build up some pathogens actually within the tank. And we usually recommend that people use it up in early in spring as possible. Don't hold it all summer until it's all had a chance to stew there and have bacteria and junk growing in it, and then use it up uh, in, the, in the late summer. Just get, get rid of it as quickly as you can. Plus, if you empty the tanks out early, they might fill up again. So rainwater harvesting is an interesting thing. It's an interesting technology. It's not, I, I'm not as big on it as I used to be, but um, it has its place. And then related to that is gray water. Um, gray water is the water that comes off of your internal house use, like washing machines, showers, sinks, and certain things. It's not black water, which comes from toilets. Um, it is legal in Oregon. Uh, my friend Art Ludwig, who wrote this book over here, Creating an Oasis with Gray Water, is the world authority on gray water, or one of them. And um, even he agrees gray water is not for everyone, and he spent most of his career promoting it. Um, it's, it's good to use. Again, it's not that much water. Um, when you think about how much water you create with your showers and you know your laundry load um, every once in a while, it's really not that, that consequential. But on the other hand, it's not that hard to create a simple system. And, and our arts book is really good because it shows some simple ways to do gray water, not anything that's going to cost thousands of dollars and be a maintenance problem. Uh, you do have to manage the gray water and the gray water system carefully. Um, it's worth looking into. Um, it's not for everyone. There's tons of information on the internet about this. So it's just another thing that you could possibly do. And then there's this. Here's one weird tip, watering by hand. The American Water Works Association about 30, 35 years ago did a study and they found that watering by hand uses about 30% less water than the average sprinkler system. That's interesting. Um, and it's great for particularly spot watering or watering your whole property if you have the time for that. It does take time and it takes time to do it right because you want to apply enough water to really soak in to the root zone that top 12 to 18 inches. Um, and you think about the amount of water coming out of a small hose, it's really not that much. So it's better for spot watering than trying to water an entire property. But it's simple, it's cheap, and there's less what I call gizmo blight, so it's a hose, and that's it. And um, on my own property, I have a combination of sprinklers, a drip, I have a controller, and I do hand watering in some areas. I have no infrastructure. Because when you think about it, all this irrigation stuff is PVC or polyethylene. It's, again, fossil fuels embodied in materials. Uh, it has an environmental impact and it's not a perfect thing to do. Ideally, we would have no irrigation systems at all, but because of the way that we live and we don't have time to spend our lives watering all summer, um, they do come in handy. So, but it's, uh, you kind of hold your nose and put in an irrigation system sometimes because it does have impacts. Again, the grid, drip on a grid, I think I covered that pretty well, but um, you know, uh, I have found that this is really the best approach for anything other than turf uh, or low ground covers, which I really don't like too many low ground covers anyway. Um, drip on a grid will handle almost everything else. By the way, and this is just an aside, these are the emitters in the tubing. Here's the tubing and this little gizmo, which is called a tortuous path emitter because the water comes in and 
through here and goes through all these little labyrinthine passages and it regulates, accurately regulates the flow of water out the little orifice, which is this little blue dot right here. If anybody can figure out how they get these emitters into this tubing during manufacture, I would really like to know about that because I've been mystified for my whole career about that. It's really interesting. But this stuff works and the emitters can't fall off because they're in the tubing and it's, it's a very durable system. It'll last for many years. So the last thing I really want to cover is how do you manage water? What does it mean now that we've got an infrastructure? What does it mean to manage water? How would you do that? Well, we saw the picture of a water audit and the catch cans. And a water audit is a very interesting tool that almost nobody uses other than, again, professionals. One weird tip. Uh, um, and, and it's simple. You put out catch cans and you put some at the heads and you put some out in the area of the lawn where the heads squirt. And by the way, a sprinkler head shoots most of its water out in the distance and it relies on the adjacent head to shoot water back to here. And that's called head to head coverage where it's doing this. This is watering to this head, this head's watering to this head, okay? What you're trying to um, accomplish with a water audit is, is basically two things. One is to see what's called distribution uniformity. Is this system really watering accurately? I mentioned that an overhead sprinkler system is only ever gonna be 70% efficient. And there's a reason for that. That is that these heads are making curves. So you're watering curves in an area that were overlap with curved spray patterns simply cannot be 100% efficient just because of the geometry. But if you can get to that 70%, you're doing pretty well. If you're at 30% or 20% or 50%, or what's happening is you're overwatering to compensate for the dry spots that occur because you don't have good distribution uniformity. And then you're overwatering the rest of the lawn or ground cover and you're wasting water. So we wanna get the distribution uniformity as accurate as possible. Once you find out through this water audit, which I'll explain how to do it in a minute, that your distribution uniformity is maybe subpar, then you look at head spacing, nozzles, and you do whatever's necessary to get it up and then you retest. The second thing that we're looking at is also very important, and that's what's called precipitation rate, which means how much water is this putting down in inches per hour. And if you don't know that, you don't know how long to water, you don't know how long to program your controller for, or how long to turn it on if it's a manual system. You're just guessing. But if you know the precipitation rate, let's say this system puts out an inch of water per hour, and you've got a lawn that needs three and needs an inch of water per week and it's in a hot area and you want to water three times a week, you just divide an inch by three and you put down a third of an inch every time, which is 20 minutes, 20 minutes on Monday, 20 minutes on Thursday, 20 minutes on Saturday, okay? So it makes it fairly simple. How do you do it? You run the system with these catch cans in place and actually you'll have a lot more than, than what's shown here. You might have 20 of them out there to do a real water on it. And you run it for 15 minutes and then you turn it off and you measure the depth of water in each of the cans and you make a note of it on a little graph. And some of them might be a quarter of an inch and others might be a half an inch. Now you got a distribution uniformity problem, right? Because it's watering more here than it is there. And then you add up all of those and you divide by the number of catch cans to get an average and that's your precipitation rate, okay? Simple, easy math, third grade math, anybody can do it, I can do it, you can do it. And then of course, beyond the water audit and beyond getting your system tuned up, you have to know your soils. Uh, are they clay? Are they sandy? How much water do they hold? Then develop a watering schedule based on what you now know about precipitation rate in inches per hour. And by the way, you can't do this with drip. You just know the, the um, amount of application based on the gallons per hour of the emitters. So that's a whole different thing. The water audit is just for overhead sprinklers. You develop a watering schedule, but then here's the next weird trick. You have to adjust for weather conditions. If it's hotter, you might need to water more. If it's raining, you need to turn it off. Um, you still have to be a gardener. You still have to use your head. You still have to think it through. You can't just program a controller and walk away forever. You also have to make seasonal changes and you have to remember 
when to turn the controller off seasonally when the rains start because you don't need it anymore. It's cold, it's wet. Don't be watering all through the winter. It's ridiculous and it's a waste of water. You also don't want to water when it's, when it's windy. Um, and you want to watch your plants for what are called indicator plants, which means something in your planting is going to show drought stress first. It might, you don't want it to wilt, but it might show a little slowdown in growth. If it's a lawn, you step on it, it doesn't spring back. Um, leaves will curl down and you, you walk around and you notice your garden. You're a gardener, that's your job. And um, you take a cue from the plants and say, maybe it's time to water, but that's not all there is to it. Okay, um, you want to water early in the mornings when there's less wind and less heat and less evaporation, and you set the plants up for the day, kind of like a good breakfast, you know. Uh, check the soil moisture before watering. Hang on, because I got a weird tip on that. Don't water when it's windy or hot. Hopefully you water before it gets windy, before it gets hot. If you watch the weather forecast, and if it's going to be hot, water in the morning. Don't wait, okay. A rain sensor, hang on, I'll get to that in a minute. Indicator plants and keep the weeds down because weeds compete with plants for water. They use a lot of water. Now, what is this gonna do for you? Well, first of all, let's take a look at your water use winter versus summer. And I wanna see how I'm doing on time. We're pretty good. I'm gonna, I've got just a little more to do and then we'll have some questions. In January, you're not watering, hopefully. So let's say an HCF is 748 gallons of water. And that would be if you get your water bill and you look at it in January, it says 4HCF, that's your in-house in watering. And that's what you use for showers and cooking and laundry and whatever. And if in July it's 14, then you've got a water, landscape water demand of 10 HCF in July when it's hot. Just simple subtraction. That's 7,480 gallons of water just for one month. Now, let's say that we reduce that. And I used this in a different lecture and I, it said reduced by 76%. I can't remember where I got that, but it doesn't matter. You could do that. Uh, I proved that in some other lecture, some other time. So you save a whole lot of money <clears throat> for that month. Your new monthly water bill, instead of being $50 for that landscape water, this 10 HCF, is now $12. And that's enough for dinner out. Okay, so there's a personal financial benefit. A couple more things. I said, check soil moisture. Well, you can poke your finger in the ground. You can dig up the soil. I like this. This is a moisture meter. You've probably seen these things, the cheap version of these, uh, you know, at the uh, garden center for $7.95 and they're plastic and they break right away. This is a professional version. It's only $40. The company, by the way, is called Rio Temp. And I love this thing. It's a tank. I, I use it all the time in the summer. And it's just a little gauge. It's, it's, you can calibrate it and you push it in the ground and it tells you what's going on down in the root zone. And when, I, when I'm faced with a warm or a hot day or thinking that I might need to water, I grab that, I walk around the yard and I stick it in everywhere, here, there and everywhere. By the time I'm done, maybe 10 minutes to walk around, um, I know where I need to water because this thing has told me. I'm not just watering blind anymore. I'm not watering everything because I know it's gonna be hot. And you'll be surprised at how many areas have plenty of water when you think you need to water. I recommend these to all my clients and I think everybody should have one. Here's the other weird tip, which is a rain sensor. This goes up in the eaves and it sends a signal to your controller, <coughs> excuse me, which says, hey, it's raining out there, turn off. And it shuts the controller off. And then when the rain goes away and it's time to water again, it automatically turns it back on. You don't have to think about it at all. Everybody should have one of these if they have an automatic controller. Okay, so this is what we talked about. Adapted landscape, hydrozones, harvesting rainwater and gray water, consider watering by hand, drip on a grid and managing water. So um, as we say in the business, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I hope you're all still there. Uh, a couple things they wanted me to, or they allowed me to mention my books and you can order them uh, at owendell.com, which is my website. Sustainable Landscaping for Dummies is everything you need to know. And if you happen to want to go into the landscaping business, uh, well, good luck with that, but you can get this book and you'll do better, hopefully. And then we also do uh, landscape architecture, residential, commercial, and public landscape design, and would be happy to help you with that. So that is my story. It is now 
1251, pretty good. And we have time for a few questions if there are any. We do have one question already in the chat. If any of the rest of you have questions, go ahead and type them in. Okay. Uh, the question refers back to the drip on a grid slide that you had. Okay. Uh, is that core fabric on the hillside? Will that keep the weeds down too? Oh, the fabric on the hillside? Um, that is an erosion control fabric for a steep slope. It doesn't really keep the weeds down. And, and those weed control fabrics, most landscapers with any experience will not use them. They are not a good idea. Now, if we go back to that slide, I don't know if I can get back to that slide. Yeah, we can do that. Let's see. I want you to look at that for a minute because it's a very interesting question. Um, so this fabric is erosion control fabric and it's jute netting and there's some made of coir, which is a coconut fiber that offers a higher degree of protection. It's a denser blanket and it's to keep the soil from going down the hillside. Um, what we would do next in a situation like this, and I really should have mentioned this during the talk, the next step in this project, once the plants are all in and the drip is in, and of course the fabric is in, is we cover it with a mulch of wood chips that's three to four inches thick. And that keeps the weeds down, hides the drip tubing, keeps the moisture in the soil, protects the soil from overheating or rude temperature changes, um, and is beneficial to the plants. So that's what keeps the weeds down. And then of course, hand weeding. We'd rather you didn't use herbicides uh, if you can possibly avoid it. So I hope that answers that question. Thank you. We have another question. How far away from the crown should you drip? Ah, that's a good question. Um, it, this, is, this is one of the, and you know, nothing is perfect um, in this world. And I've had irrigation people say, yeah, sprinklers work great until you put the plants in the ground. Uh, and then the plants get in the way of the sprinklers. Well, that's true. And with drip system, um, these work great, except they're not completely perfect. And, you know, the plants have to go where they go. And we try to keep the, the tubing and therefore the emitters, you know, at least six or eight inches away. But when you're at 12 inches on center uh, between runs of tubing, you've really only got six inches to deal with. And yeah, it's kind of, it's imperfect. It works pretty well. Now, some people, um, if you read the books about this system um, from the manufacturers and the design manuals, they say, well, if you're in clay soil, you can even go 18 inches apart with your tubing or even 24. Well, I've tried that and it doesn't really work that well. Eventually, yes, the roots will grow to where the drippers are, where the water is. But if you want a uniform wetting pattern underground, from that lateral motion of the, uh, of the water coming out of each emitter that's spreading underground, then you really have to be at 12 inches. And my experience is, despite the theoretical physics involved, is even with clay soils, the lateral motion, the lateral movement is not much more than, than 12 inches. So given that, and given that you have to or want to, have these lines and therefore emitters 12 inches apart, you don't have much room away from the plants. But on the other side of it, I've never had a problem with plants drowning because of this system. So apparently, and this is based on tens of thousands of emitters and, and thousands of jobs, uh, or hundreds anyway, not, probably not thousands, um, that works. So I would say keep it um, as close to six inches away uh, as possible. That's that the last question that we have in the chat so far. If anybody else had a question, go ahead and type it in there. And just a quick announcement while we're waiting for more questions, if you have any. Um, our next round of First Fridays will be the first Friday of June. And we have a guest speaker with a talk on solarization. So it could be another way to help control weeds and to keep them from starting to grow in your landscape. Um, and then let's see, oh, we have a message. Thank you. This was very interesting and helpful. And I definitely agree with that. Some great information. So thank you, Owen, for being willing to come and talk with us today. Thank you. I didn't have to go anywhere and it's a pleasure. I've enjoyed it. And I really appreciate everybody's time and attention. So thanks. Yeah, um, just so all of our participants know, you'll be getting an email next week from me and that will have a, um, a document that Owen gave us, kind of some pro tips for uh, saving some water. 
And also you'll get a link to the Marion SWCD's uh, YouTube channel, which will end up having the recording from today on there. So thank you all once again for joining us and especially Owen, and hopefully we'll see you next month.